Hi, everybody. I'm Maria Bartiromo, and this is the Business of Innovation. Continuing our discussion now of evolution and revolution, we're joined by some experts in the field. Virginia Postrel is the author of The Substance of Style and a contributing editor for The Atlantic Monthly, where she writes a column on culture and commerce. She is also a columnist for Forbes. Robert Tucker joins us now from Atlanta, Georgia. He's the president of the Innovation Resource, an internationally recognized leader in the field of innovation. And from San Francisco, author and speaker Gary Hamill is with us. Gary Hamill is director of the Management Innovation Lab at London Business School and founder of Stratigos, an international consulting company that specializes in innovation. Nice to have you all with us. Virginia, you've often spoken of dynamism and how progress can come in unpredictable ways. Can established corporations or organizations really evolve and innovate, or is that just the domain of the new guy? Absolutely, established corporations can evolve and innovate, and it's not just the little guy, but there are some difficulties for a larger organization. Ron, but I, I've heard that you speak of uh, CEOs as having ADD when it comes <laughs> to innovation, right? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the average tenure of a CEO today, uh, Maria, is about three years. So. They've got to get the stock price up. They've got to get growth happening. Uh, so you know, they've got a lot of things to pay attention to. So I think right now, today, I mean, what you're seeing is they want to innovate. They know they need to innovate. They must innovate. But they have uh, a lot of priorities on their plate that distract them from uh, innovation. Gary, you seem to be a firm believer in the idea that a company can reinvent itself. I mean, Robert is talking about reinventing and innovation from within. Talk to us, Gary, about reinventing the company from within and how management uh, can do it if they have the DNA. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think DNA is really the critical word there, Maria. You know, if you look at it, anybody who's spent time trying to get big companies to innovate, you know, pretty soon you feel like you're teaching, trying to teach a dog to walk on its hind legs. If you get the right incentives, you get its attention, you know, you can get it up on its hind legs for a while, but the moment you turn your back, the dog is back on all fours because it has quadruped DNA after all. I think the, the real question is how can you teach these old dogs new tricks? And I think what's, how the future is going to be different than the past is that companies will not survive if they don't implement a systematic process for innovation that keeps innovation on the front burner all the time. But wouldn't a systematic process for innovation include actually very smart people who aren't particularly interested in the product line, but much more about new ideas? And wouldn't it include people who really wanted to listen to new ideas? And isn't that really rare in a big corporation? Well, it might. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, are, there are so many approaches. I would say there's been more change in the uh, innovation field, the practice of innovation, over the last five years than over the last 25 mm -hmm. or 50 years. Really what it comes down to is, does the CEO of the organization have the willpower to drive innovation, to drive growth from the very top? What is P&G doing right, Robert? Just about everything at the moment, I would say. I, I think that uh, what Lafley has done in terms of breaking down the barriers between divisions, between business units, looking outside for ideas, creating an environment, rebranding, reinvigorating the brands there, I would give them uh, an A plus uh, at the current time. Okay. Uh, also, GE and other companies yeah. too. Gary? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. You know, I think the big thing that uh, Lafley's trying to blow up is this idea that ideas only start inside. Obviously, today they come from everywhere. You got to look at the world like this Lego kit of competencies and technologies, and and put them together in new ways. But I think it's also kind of challenging the notion that innovation always has to be really expensive and a bet the farm kind of thing. One thing that we haven't talked about that P&G is getting right right now is taking their traditional idea, which was innovation equals technological innovation. That is something that could win in a white box, a, a new and improved product, and marrying that to a new appreciation of design and aesthetics. And my, my favorite example of this, because it's so mundane, is there is a gorgeous bottle that the uh, Crest Pro Health mouthwash comes in. And it looks like a perfume bottle or something. It's beautiful. And I sure brought, wish we'd stop uh, talking about toothpaste. Consumer. You know, innovation <laughs> is a much more interesting subject than toothpaste. The last show we were talking about toothpaste, I'm we're talking, talking about, about toothpaste bottles. again. <laughs> Enough with the toothpaste. Well, they've been innovative with their toothpaste. I guess, but there's more important issues in the world about innovation. Can we talk about oh, Frappuccino? <laughs> yeah, no, sure. That's it uh, sure. Well, let me tell you, Frappuccino is a good example. You know where that came from? Not out of the, the corporate labs or the corporate headquarters at all. Two barristers in Santa Monica, California. They were serving coffee in a hot afternoon in uh, Santa Monica, started messing around with uh, 
different concoctions, and lo and behold, came up with a breakthrough product. It's a great conversation. Thank you so much, all of you. We so appreciate it. Virginia, Robert, Gary, terrific conversation. Thank you.